I think we've got a lot in common, um, <laughs> separated by a little bit of time, but two mm. different incidents that I think profoundly affected our lives. And El Pinery was the one I met, because I'm 20 k's north of Gawler, and when I first noticed some smoke checked on the CFS site, fire at Pinery, even though it was a bad day, I knew, you know, well, that's over at Pinery, that's 30 kilometres away. I thought, you know, poor buggers there, really, you know, like I wouldn't like to be fighting that on a day like today. The plan was, and it always was, that if I get time, I'll just dampen everything down. And, um, which took some running around. Unfortunately, yeah. I did have a couple of hours to do that. So, mm. uh, well, to hear it roar over top mm. and watch it burn 60 acres of barley out of a western window in minutes. Yes. Hold tight in the house till the smoke alarms go off, the mm. power goes off. <laughs> and thinking, right, now maybe it'll be better out there than in here. Yeah. And you step out and you look downwind and up over the horizon and it's black and gone. Yes. That was, that just left me gobsmacked. Mm. Everything I dampened was absolutely fine. Yeah. But anything I hadn't damned, hadn't got to, if I yeah. didn't, didn't hit them with those, mm. they were burning, you know? You'd gotten to the point where you said, right, I've got to dampen everything down. Mm. What then helped you make decisions and stay informed up until the point where oh, the well, fire was on you? Um, yeah, well, really, it was, the, the CFS um, SMS messages. Yes. Which which give me an update on where it's progressed to. Mm. I could say the other bit of information was the the weather, the wind forecast, because um, you know it crosses my mind. How do you run away from something that's forty kilometres wide and travelling at sixty kilometres mm. an hour towards you? Well, if you leave too late, you can't outrun us, right? That's the thing. That's exactly right. We already knew in advance that in our yeah. area, um, a catastrophic fire day was uh, forecast. Yes. Um, yep. What we got through media and websites and the newspaper mm. correlated what, uh, with what the environment felt like. So around here, we had high winds. We had yeah. really dry uh, conditions. Uh, it was very hot yeah. uh, and it was just an angry sky that yeah. morning, we knew it was bad. I think about 8.30 in the morning, uh, I got my operations manager to pull up all the, um, the CFS websites uh, on the office computer. And uh, we tuned the radio in uh, to the channel where we knew we could get the best information. Yeah. And we started looking at um, what the wind angles were exactly like you did. Yeah. The first thing I did was after telling everyone at work to literally, you know, um, get everything ready, generators on, the whole yeah. bit, roll out the fire hoses, everything. Yeah. I rang uh, my other half, Teresa, and I said, evacuate now, get out, gone. Oh, was um, she at home? She was at home, and so I said, get out now, yeah. um, and just go, because then I don't have to worry about you. That's one less thing I'm distracted by. Okay, um, nice. If we didn't have children, I would have happily fought the fire alongside her. She's very capable, but yeah. with children in the mix, no good. Yeah. She went to her mother's place in the city. I can see a bit of the army coming out yeah. now. <laughs> really. I had, at that point, I had two dilemmas. Do I stay at work and protect uh, everything at work, which is a fuel depot, a truck fleet, the office, yeah. Yeah. and my capacity to both employ people and pay bills, <laughs> or do I protect my house? Because they were yeah. both threatened at the same time when the wind changed and I couldn't physically get to the house by the time I literally watched the, fl the flames roar up through um, into the roof yeah. and in the gutters and yeah. up she went. And the next morning, I just wandered the main street and it was something out of a movie where there were just people in shock. They were traumatized. Uh, they were um, people who, who'd come into the town because their home was burnt and they sought refuge in the town. I think it was about two days before we got wow. reliable communications out. Yeah. Um, what I did immediately the morning after the fire was I set up a relief centre in the town and then by 11 o'clock that morning I called a town meeting on the yeah. Oval said look this is what we're going to do 
Um, this is what we don't know about the situation, you know, when the power's coming on, when we're going to mm. get communications again. Mm. This is what I want everyone in the town to do. You know, start looking after each other, checking on your neighbours, um, you know, start mm. securing water, food, um, animals and all those sorts of things. All this without being able to communicate with your wife in Adelaide. After the event, she told me she was very, very anxious about what had happened up here because there was simply no way of finding out. Going back to the communications and the emotion of it, uh, as I was saying earlier, I had to eventually ignore phone mm. calls and reserve it just for CFS messages and things like that. And to the point that when I took shelter in the house, the phone rang again, I looked at it, because now I wasn't busy wetting everything down, and it was my sister-in-law. I thought, I'd better answer it, because my wife could be there. You mm. know? So I answered it, and it was my sister-in-law, Julie. She said, uh, Ian, you can come to our place if you want to. I said, too late, it's here, hang up. comes right at the front gate. I didn't think about it then, but I thought about it afterwards. Mm. Uh, you know, just uh, picturing my sister-in-law getting off the phone and Rose is saying, what did he say? He said, it's too late, it's here. You know what I mean? Yeah. But that, having to hang up on them, yeah. um, it was a necessity at the time. But that did give me some black days. Yes. Or oh, probably six weeks later, you know. So uh, normally a very bulletproof character. Yes. And I'm looking at you and I reckon you are too normally, mm. but for the first time in my life, you know, a little black dog visited, you know. Yes. So when my family first came um, back up the hill, I mean, the reuniting with them uh, was really difficult. One of the things that was really interesting in my family situation is uh, when we, as a family, went back to the house. And my daughter, for some days, had been wearing a fairy dress. I didn't understand. She couldn't communicate. I didn't think to ask any questions about why she was wearing this thing. But I said, you sure you want your fairy dress on because pretty dirty here, you know, you might get it dirty. And she said to me these words, I'm keeping it on because I'm waiting for my magic to come back so I can fix everything. Wow. And that, you know, I mean, look at me, I'm struggling. That, that just floored me because that was her first point of mm. communicating with me what she was feeling and how she was mm. processing what had happened in her little wow. world. That's you know, as a parent, mm. Mm. the hardest thing was being a good parent and a supportive, empathetic parent mm. in a really horrible environment for these little children. Mm. What would be the key, the key thing if you was to say, if there was one thing or one group of things that would be the best way to stay informed in an event like this, what would you come up with? Regardless of whether you make the stay or the go decision, the most crucial part of that is how you're getting your information. And a lot of people think that before a fire, you only need to have a fire plan and uh, start rehearsing and practicing that and understanding it if you're gonna stay. You still need to know that if you're gonna go as well. Mm. What roads am I gonna use? So understanding mm. where your information's gonna come from, mm. firstly, through technology, through the apps, through the radio, have backups. Don't just mm. have one source of information on the day. Mm. Have multiple sources of information and have a plan for if you lose them. A lot of people um, that I've spoken to who have a few regrets about the last fire season thought they didn't need a fire plan. What's your thoughts on that? Um, the easiest way to answer it is to ask them what they did on a day and the first thing they will admit to is that they didn't know what to do, mm. right? So, so they quickly become confused, scared, and, uh, and hence make bad decisions, leave too late, panic. Exactly. You know? So the, the, the long and short of it is 
have a plan. Have a plan, then you, you will never stay calm without a plan.